Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Cost Savings with ServiceNow ITAM, a deep dive into the ROI of IT asset management. Before we begin, I'd like to give a little bit of background information on GlideFast Consulting. GlideFast is an elite ServiceNow partner that is exclusively dedicated to the ServiceNow platform. With over 3,100 ServiceNow certifications, a team of over 500 expert consultants, a 4.8 out of 5 CSAT score, over 1,000 successful projects, and over 3,500 years of combined ServiceNow experience, GlideFast was named the 2022 Elite ServiceNow Partner of the Year. Before we begin today's webinar, and I hand it over to Chris, Sandeep, and Lawrence, we'd like to give a poll for all of you to see where you're at in your IT asset management journey. Are you currently using ServiceNow for your asset management tracking? All right, it looks like we are just about split. 55% of you have said yes, and 44% have said no. Now, I'd like to hand it over to Lawrence to kick it off about HAM. All right, thanks for that, Lauren. Hey, everyone, my name is Lawrence Tyndall here at GlideFast Consulting, and it's amazing to have everyone here on this presentation today. So just before we jump into it, so what's the agenda today? So we're gonna be covering what is hardware asset management, and what's the difference between IT service management, asset management, and HAM Pro? And then we're going to be going into what is software asset management. And then after that, SAM Foundation versus SAM Pro versus SAM Enterprise. After that, we're going to, then going to be going into enterprise asset management, EAM, with Sandeep. And then we're also going to have a discussion on pain points around asset management. And then towards the end of this webinar, we're going to have an open Q&A where you guys can actively participate with us, ask questions, and we'll answer those questions. Okay, so what is an asset? So an asset is any resource or capability, including anything that could contribute to the delivery of a service. So assets can include things like hardware, software licenses, buildings, consumables, and equipment and things of that nature. So if you look at your typical enterprise, you could have hardware assets like servers, laptops, computers, IP phones, and things like that. And if we think about software licenses, we have things that are like Zoom or Office 365, Adobe Creative Cloud, and things of that nature. So assets can be things that are tangible and non-tangible. So they can be physical or non-physical. Okay, so asset management and configuration management. So two sides of the coin. What are the differences between an asset and a CI? So an asset, you care about tracking the item's purchase, price, its cost, its depreciation, and things of that nature. And you also want to track like its physical aspect, like is it in use, is it in stock, is it lost, is it stolen, and things of that nature. Whereas with a configuration item, you're tracking the configuration of the asset, like its IP address, its host name, its MAC address, you know, what software is installed in, and things like that. So the major differences between an asset and a CI is an asset is tracked all the way from when it's procured all the way to when it's disposed and everything in between. Whereas with a configuration item, it's only tracked while it's in use. So you're tracking all of its live attributes. So another piece of tracking that you do with assets is you track its warranty information, its contracts and things like that. And then with a CI, you track things like its upstream and downstream dependencies. So whether the server is connected to a database or maybe the server is connected to a website, and you can really see that upstream and downstream view. So the life cycle difference between an asset and a configuration item. So you can see here on the previous slide, I mentioned that for an asset, you track it all the way from procurement all the way through to disposal. So you can see with asset management, it focuses on the request, the procurement, the receiving while it's in stock, and then all the way to when the asset is disposed of your ITED vendor. Whereas with a CI, it's only tracked while it's in use. So you can see all move ads and changes are tracked, all support activities are tracked, and then it's monitored to ensure that uh, the configuration item is running as smoothly as possible. And then it's also tracked while it's deployed too. So you can see just simply from this diagram, asset management is around the physical aspects of an asset and configuration management is around the configuration, you know, managing what's on the device, how it's running, what its health looks like, and things of that nature. So what is hardware asset management? So hardware asset management is the end-to-end -end management of an organization's hardware assets from cradle to grave. So if you think about when you're procuring an asset, 
you know, you may go to your favorite vendor's website like CDW, or maybe it's, uh, you know, you go directly to Dell or someone like that and you procure those assets. Typically with organizations, you'll create something called a purchase order or also known as a PO. That's basically the official process that organizations go through to procure assets. So from a purchase order, you then receive the assets once you've paid for them and they get delivered. And then once you receive them, they then go into a stock room and you deploy them, they go into in use. And then at the end of their useful life, which we also refer to as end of life, the assets then get disposed. Hardware asset management is really tracking that whole end-to-end -end life cycle from when an asset is procured all the way through to you disposing that asset once it's reached its end of life. So without a hardware asset management program in place, organizations wouldn't know, you know where assets are, who's using them, and things of that nature. Okay, so IT service management, asset management versus HAM Pro. So in ServiceNow, there's two different tiers of hardware asset management that you can have. So you have the basic hardware asset management or ITSM asset management that comes with ITSM. So with this particular application, you can track hardware models, hardware assets, consumable models, consumables, locations, stock rooms, stock rules, and hardware model life cycles. Whereas with Hardware Asset Management Pro, which, which is the licensable application from ServiceNow, you can track disposal orders, advanced shipment notifications, loaner asset orders, inventory stock orders, the hardware asset dashboard, asset audits, hardware asset management content service, hardware model normalization. And there's also the hardware asset reclamation workflow, and there's RMA orders, and then there's hardware asset refresh orders. So you can see that the differences is really that the basic ITSM asset management just gives you the basic features to track um, the basic life cycle of a hardware asset. Whereas with Hardware Asset Management Pro, it really takes you to that next level of maturity with hardware asset management. And you're able to you know, really track every single process that an asset goes through throughout its life cycle. And it ensures that if you follow all of these you know, modules and workflows and features in the system that you're going to be aligned to the best practices of hardware asset management, and you're going to get the highest return on investment out of your assets. Okay, so the return on investment, also known as ROI gain from hardware asset management. So if you have a successful hardware asset management program in place, you know, you can realize the gains from your ROI in ways such as, you know, reusing assets. So let's say you have various stock rooms all over the world and you decide to reuse used assets so that you're not always purchasing new ones. You know, you're able to gain a return on investment from your hardware asset management program by reusing existing assets. So instead of the procurement team having to procure more assets, you can reuse existing assets. For example, when an end user leaves the company, you get their laptop and monitor and docking station back. And then when the next employee starts, instead of purchasing new assets, redeploy those assets. So just having that visibility of assets in your stock rooms across the globe, you're able to get the higher return on investment from your asset management program. So another return on investment that you can get from hardware asset management is a faster employee onboarding and offboarding. So if you know what hardware assets that you already own and where they're located, when new employees start the organization, you're able to deploy those assets much quicker and you're able just to check the system to see what assets you have without having to scramble around and uh, you know order things just in time and things like that. And then also with offboarding, if you have a clear process in place for your hardware asset management program, you're able to offboard employees much easier and faster and smoother. And then reduce spend on new assets. So we kind of talked about this before. So with a hardware asset management program in place, you're able to reduce the spend on new assets by reusing existing assets and also reduce security breaches. So if you don't know what assets you own, how do you know which assets are vulnerable, which assets are lost, which are stolen, who has them, where they are, what software is on them? You know, without that information, you're enabled to, you know, understand your security position, your vulnerability, you know, score and things like that. And then last but not least, one of the other return on investments that you can gain from a hardware asset management practice is faster asset refreshes. So if you know all of the assets that are deployed, who's using them, when they were purchased, how long is left of their useful life, you're able to make asset refreshes 
a much smoother process because you can literally just run a reporting service now and say, okay, you know, we have 300 laptops in this particular office. They've all been in use for three years. Let's refresh them now. And this is how much it's going to cost. Okay, well, now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Chris Kieser, who's going to talk about software asset management. Perfect. Thanks, Lawrence. Appreciate it. All right, folks. Well, we're going to get into software asset management, and I'm going to try and go somewhat quick. There's some similar aspects, as we know, within asset management, some of the terminology we use, normalization, life cycle, and those kinds of things, as, as Lawrence was talking about, that are also applicable when we come to the software asset management component. And I am going to deal with this primarily from the SAM Pro and, and SAM Enterprise perspective. There is the SAM Foundation component, as mentioned in the outline for our for our time together today but the the biggest advantage and when we talk return on investment within sam leveraging the the library the kind of the content library that's part of service now is a huge part of that because that is maintained not only by a team at ServiceNow, but it's also through relationship that ServiceNow has with a lot of these publishers, especially when we talk about, and as we'll look at momentarily, things like publisher packs coming directly from companies like Microsoft, uh, IBM, Oracle, all of which have unique and customized aspects to what the metrics are by which they measure the licensing of their products. And so having that at your disposal within a SAM Pro perspective to be able to assist in the compliance standing of your products is a really critical path in the aspect of software asset management. As well, when we talk about uh, SAM Pro, just a few of the things on here, you can see the idea of having your entitlements and kind of that single pane of glass tying together with software models. Uh, reclaiming automated through low usage software through rules defined by you know how frequently you would want somebody to be using a particular product to quantify its appropriate usage in your environment as well as defining what software is blacklisted or restricted in your environment ensuring that you know no software is kind of getting through into your environment that shouldn't be there either from a classification perspective of you know, games and those kinds of things that people might have on a on a device or uh, or those kinds of things, or you know, software that's deemed as a security risk because of its use cases or breaches or things like that. Uh, we also have aspects the the normalization of publisher and products as we talked about, and one really critical aspect as well that I think is growing in popularity as we're all aware of is the idea of suite definitions. So when you talk about being able to appropriately understand what something like Creative Cloud All Apps includes. All of us are very familiar with Office 365 based products, you know, that typical Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Outlook, and the things that are associated with that suite, and that all of the models that are associated with that to define a consumption of that product and being able to transparently see how that's leveraged in your environment, along with your subscription management through direct integrations with your, your tenants like Zoom, Dropbox, you know, Oracle environments, IBM environments, Office, Adobe, et cetera, and your single sign-on solutions that can track logins to particular products that you might have in your environment. There's also the addition of, in the enterprise aspect to look at enhancements with normalization through machine learning, as well as the cloud insights component to start to get kind of predictive and, and get a larger picture of your cloud infrastructure and where it might make sense to eventually move to the cloud, where it might make sense to uh, look at things like your AWS setups, Google Cloud overall, and how that how those networks tie into the overall management of your enterprise. Next, we, we move into really some of the biggest challenges with, with effectively managing your return in software asset management. And, and a big question is really that uncertain compliance position. So how to manage, how to measure, how to optimize. And a, a big part of that is really the differentiation of how your software is counted. Uh, we have both on-premise licensing for devices within our network. We have cloud-based licensing. We have licensing that might be related to VDIs in our environment. We have licenses that are based on servers or data centers and, and how that impacts what our license cost is. So all of those different positions 
being able to come in and connect so that you can transparently see what's being leveraged at any given time. Also, just understanding the measurement of what's accurately being used with things like, you know, usage reporting of software. You know, this, this product has gone unused for a certain period of time based on its last report, or it's been used less than a certain defined period within uh, a given month, an hour, two hours over the last three months. That's, uh, you know, a good definition in a more simplistic example, but really just understanding, you know, are we just giving out software because it's being requested, it's being asked for? Are we appropriately reclaiming when it's underused? Just trying to really appropriately know that when we are purchasing our software products, they're purchased intentionally and they're purchased and used appropriately by the people asking for them within our environment so that we don't just have stale software that might be used by a real person, might be installed on an actual machine, but isn't actually being, being used appropriately. And then the other component of this is really just optimization. How do we optimize our use cases? You know, when we look at our, our legacy tool sets, our end of life products, you know, they're no longer supported by the environment. I think, uh, you know, a good example that maybe some of us can, can chuckle a little bit about is you know, how much people wanted to even hold on to uh, Microsoft XP operating systems back in the day, even though they were sunset quite some time ago, you still saw, you know, meet some small and even some medium sized businesses really trying to hold on to the XP operating system, uh, even though it was a it was a legacy tool, it really needed to be retired that in increased risk. So just being able to have that picture of what your end of life products are looking like, when to pull them out of your environment, when to potentially upgrade, and if they're being used. And, and so the various complexities associated with software licensing is something that is a huge return on your investment in getting this process going for yourself and also pays dividends to you by being able to transparently see uh, the accuracy of your usage. Keeping track of that, you also have your software asset management. So, I mean, these are the kinds of things when you look at the screen, I won't read through all the definitions, but these are the things we're trying to reconcile and bring together. And of course, one of our terms is reconciliation, uh, understanding what's discovered in our environment, what that discovery model is, how do we match that to our entitlement, our licensing structure, which is the actual asset in this scenario, our software entitlements are our assets that are tied to a particular model. So being able to pull from those sources of truth, from the cloud, from our integrations, from our on-premise, from our servers, and have that understood and being able to tie that and say, our entitlement is actually being consumed. The number of licenses we have for this product are being consumed, whether by a device, a person, the number of cores on a device, uh, on, on a server, as an example, you know, depending on that licensing structure, we can calculate it and we we normalize it as well so that it is easy to understand for those using the product. You know, we don't have a continuously skewed and growing construct of, of companies for publishers. Uh, we have a simplified product definition and our versions as well can be more simplified as opposed to massive strings of numbers that uh, might mean something on a on an invoice, but when we're trying to understand what that product is in our environment to appropriately be able to see it so that we can confidently state that we are using our licenses. We're not we're not over licensed. And if we do indeed have a true up, it is a legitimate true up because we are making sure we're only purchasing what purchasing more when it's actually required, either by the growth of the business or because we are legitimately using what we have uh, based on the usage stats we get back. This is one of the ways that, that ServiceNow handles exactly what I was talking about there with normalization. So kind of bringing together those, those bifurcated, you know, Adobe, Adobe Systems, Adobe Inc., the example on the screen here that you can see, and all of those different numbered models of, of a product like Acrobat. And this has even changed again, right? So as those things change, we understand that that's ultimately a singular product. And Adobe works with the system to help us make sure that we have the appropriate information about an Adobe product, about Acrobat in particular, 
and what versions you're licensed for coming in from your tenant with Adobe, as well as uh, the product we see from the cloud and in the environment with your users. So just seeing how that, that works in, in activity, you can see this discovery model. So this record that gets produced automatically by the system to be able to show you, you know, what you've discovered. So that Zoom, Zoom 32-bit, and then your version number and how that gets normalized by the system. So we have that kind of singular understanding of a publisher, again, that singular understanding of a product that's very legible as well as a version. And we can use this information to make sure that what's found is properly aligned with your entitlement and what you're licensed for. And this is the way that that gets represented for you that work in those SAM administrator roles so that you can inform your people as well as your reporting becomes accurate because you know just to look at the slide and how model management works you can see how complex it can get upgrade rights downgrade rights what are associated with your models and how ServiceNow brings those sources your entitlement there on the right your sources of truth on the left and how that all kind of brings the pieces together to be able to give you a confident alignment to state that your entitlement is appropriately used by the appropriate product in your environment. I can't stress that enough and how significant this is for your license compliance standing, which is one of the biggest ROIs in this space. And as we discussed, really just having a, a visibility and transparency on that centralized data modeling, right? So we know that we're bringing through uh, from all of these sources into that singular pane of glass. I log into ServiceNow. I don't have to communicate with an SCCM admin, uh, a JAMF administrator. Uh, I don't have to communicate directly with the tenant owners of our various cloud-based products or SSO administrators to be able to tell us, you know, that people are logging into products. I can singularly as a SAM admin get into the environment, look at my overview and see, uh, you know, what my usage statistics are. I can see that, uh, you know, my entitlements are aligned, my allocations are in place for the users, devices, cores, et cetera, that are leveraging those licenses, all through this kind of centralized data coming into the system and aligning directly with our SAM tables and modeling structure. This is a representation of what that would look like for you as you get into the SAM workspace, really just getting that you know, initially that 10,000 foot view and then being able to dig in even deeper, you know, where are over licensed amounts, we're carrying too much, where are our true up amounts, uh, our publishers that are out of compliance, our products that are out of compliance, really how to track those down and take them through, uh, you know, is it out of compliance because we need to buy more? Is it out of compliance because we have unlicensed installs? Is it out of compliance because we had a change on a server where there's now more cores being leveraged? You know, we have a, a product that's going out of the environment and, and needs to be retired, those kinds of things. But you can kind of drill into all of these and as well see the alerts and activities you need to take part in. And then you move into your license workbench, which is where you, you do that work. You kind of dig into that individual product. You look at, you know, creating the allocations associated. It's going to intelligently help us understand what our remediation options are for a license so that you can uh, work that through and get to that, you know, green compliant check mark that we we all chase in this space, right? Making sure that we're reporting that our product is compliant. We've gone through these steps and we can uh, report on it appropriately. And then getting through to that end of life and our removal processes. So having an understanding of, you know, our products that are reaching that end of support. Oftentimes this is uh, brought into the system directly through uh, from the publisher. And you can see your sources of end of life as being the publisher. Yeah, you can see that uh, it, it needs to come out of the system because of that. And you can have justifications for removing candidates as well. You know, an employee separation, you know, as, as Lawrence talked about in, in HAM, we have that removal process or reclamation process that exists when, you know, an employee separates or a product is no longer used, being able to pull that in through a separation like that and, and properly remove the product, reclaim those allocations when appropriate, as well as considering those low usage or restricted software and being able to automatically pull those off. So we can have that, again, that transparent view of your life cycle of product and when they need to come off, when we need to claim them back, when they're underused, and when they're just old and need to be pulled out, which mitigates those security risks associated with software that's no longer receiving security updates. And that's it for me right now. I'm going to hand it over to Sandeep to get into EAM. Thanks, Chris. 
My name is Sandy Faber, and today I'll be talking about enterprise asset management. So we just heard from my esteemed colleagues how beneficial hardware and software asset management is, but where does enterprise asset management fit in? Well, enterprise asset management, EAM, focuses on all non-IT connected devices. So it can be applied and leveraged across pretty much any industry, such as healthcare, oil and gas, transportation, energy, and so many more. So when speaking with organizations, the challenges are clear when it comes to enterprise asset management. Starting with lack of visibility, companies currently lose sight of what assets they, they have essentially. So whether that is when they deploy assets out in the field or to remote workers, or when equipment is purchased outside of the standard process, or even acquired through mergers and acquisitions. Companies simply just don't know what assets they have, who's using them, who's, who owns it, who's it assigned to, what the cost is, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Moving into inventory planning, supply chain disruptions have clearly emphasized the need for inventory planning. This applies to both actual assets that an organization has, as well as spare parts as well. So organizations need to have a better, better grasp in terms of being able to predict inventory needs so that they can prevent any sort of stockouts, as well as to ensure that they don't have excessive inventory on that balance sheet, which would affect their bottom line. From a risk exposure perspective, non-documented assets increase, increase risk exposure. So when an organization does not know about assets that may have been purchased on a corporate card or outside of the standard process, it can include additional risks and concerns for an organization. And over two thirds of companies just simply struggle with identifying the unknown assets that they have. And last but not least, the inability to scale. A lot of organizations that are using these legacy systems to track their enterprise assets struggle with the capabilities and functionality to scale across their organization. So whether that is from an automated perspective to drive a lot of these processes or to integrate and to use with different product lines that it may have. How do I relate an asset to incident problem and change? Or how do I tie that back to a configuration item? When these separate systems are working in silos, it makes it very difficult for organizations to overcome that. So how do we overcome these challenges? Well, enterprise asset management can help you absolutely. So EAM oversees the full life cycle and physical business assets while leveraging all the functionality and capability of the ServiceNow platform. So I'll be going through the enterprise life cycle and highlighting the amazing features and ways organizations can leverage them while increasing their bottom line. But as I go through the life cycle, I want you to ask yourself a couple of questions. Are you able to say and clearly define what enterprise assets that you own today? Can you streamline your asset processes? And are you maximizing usable asset life and mitigating risk? So maybe you have a bunch of unused assets sitting around on the shelf, that could be redistributed or you're constantly running out of stockroom items. So where do we begin when it comes to enterprise asset management? Well, the enterprise asset workspace is your main control tower. So as you can see here from the screenshot, uh, when you load up the enterprise asset workspace, you're able to see immediately any sort of requests and the amount of different orders across the different functionalities and life cycles of your enterprise assets. You are able to see all different types of widgets and out of the box reporting capabilities as well to provide value to your job role and organization. With enterprise asset management, we understand that there can be a lot of different assets spanned across different areas of your organization. And how do you keep all of those organized and being able to efficiently report on those clearly? Well, out of the box, the asset workspace allows you to clearly identify assets that might be considered as facilities, medical, transportation, consumables, etc cetera, etc cetera. and our workspaces are designed to be customized that will allow you to bring out the most from your organization as well 
So as we go and start through the life cycle when it comes to enterprise asset management from the acquire stage, we're able to see how this allows you to, to overcome some of the challenges I was speaking before. Organizations are able to clearly show what assets are available for their end users by showing them in a service catalog with an image, a description, and even a cost as well. So you're able to understand clearly what you have from an asset perspective, as well as the understanding of what users can order. ServiceNow gives you the capability as well to not only just order it directly on your laptop or your, your main workstation, but you could be at a remote site or a different location where you have that capability of being able to leverage your mobile phone or tablet to be able to order and request assets on the go. Taking that one step further, you're able to now see where your request is from a lifecycle perspective, right? So you can see in this image below that someone has ordered some army boots and that the stage is currently in fulfillment. And we understand now that the user knows that the delivery date will be coming shortly. And again, these workflows and lifecycle stages are able to be customized uh, so that it fulfills and aligns with your business processes as well. So still in the acquire stage, how do we overcome our excess assets that we have, right? So that inventory planning, do I need to purchase when someone requires or requests something, or am I able to leverage that from an existing stock room? So with the source and transfer assets across different location feature, you have that capability of understanding if you have existing assets already in a stock room, or if you need to purchase it. Now, Stock can vary from different site to site and different organizations could have a lot of different stock rooms spread across the country or even the world. So having that capability and insight to clearly see, hey, I have this stock in another stock room and I'm able to transfer that clearly across to your existing stock room allows you to ensure that your bottom line is still good as well as maintaining a clear level of stock. So you're not always purchasing stock, you're able to leverage your existing stock and at the same time, report accurately on it, as well as inform your end user where that stock is and the process that it's moving across. So moving into the deploy feature of the life cycle, you're able to keep track of your assets on the go. So whether that is from a receiving functionality or purchasing functionality, or even an audit functionality, you're able to leverage the agent app either on your mobile phone or tablet or a device that you can load that application on where it comes to either scanning or receiving assets that you may have. Uh, it also has a functionality that you're able to take this out onto remote sites that may not have Wi-Fi connectivity or low connectivity so that you're still able to inventory your assets. And then when you do come back into some sort of a cell, cell range or Wi-Fi connectivity, it will update your ServiceNow instance automatically. Moving still to deploy the multi-component assets. And this has got to be one of my favorite features of enterprise asset management. Simply put today, assets are made up of smaller assets that make into one sort of mega asset, if you'd like to call it. Think of a assembly line that has a big robotic machine, for example. That one machine is considered an asset. However, there are smaller parts that is individual assets that could make it up as well. So when one of these assets go down, you know, your assembly line stops, affecting your bottom dollar, production is stopped, everyone is waiting until you're able to fix that asset. So if you have that understanding and insight, that, hey, this main asset is made up of smaller assets, and I'm able to now report where those smaller assets are, and they're in stock, we're able to repair it and get back to productivity uh, way more efficiently than not knowing or trying to replace one big asset at any given time. From an operation standpoint, how do we start to maintain our stock rooms, right? So we just talked about all the different stocks and having them in our stock room and readily available for you, but how do you overcome that inventory planning perspective of it, right? So with this challenge, you have automatic stock rules that allows you to ensure that any given model is up to date and is available inside your stock rooms. So if your stock that 
will fall under a specific threshold, ServiceNow has the capability of automatically creating an alert and to either purchase new stock to replenish it or to source from an existing stock room as well. So you can see here in the image um, that you know there are different uh, models here in the stock room. You can see the threshold, the order size once it below falls below that threshold. The restocking option looks to be that they're going to purchase it from a vendor and if it's pending delivery or not. So continuing on in terms of being able to get additional visibility into your assets as well as inventory planning is the asset reservation and loaner functionality of it. So if you have different medical carts, for example, that are made up of smaller assets to make one big assets, you need to have an understanding of when an asset breaks or it is not working. How do we, how do we overcome this challenge? Right. So the most common one is, hey, I broke, uh, you know, a specific item. Here's a new one and we can continue on. But that is not a feasible response when it comes to managing your enterprise assets. Often, you know, you don't have every single asset on hand to be able to replace it immediately straight away. So to overcome that, you have this functionality here to assign specific loaners and reservations. So should an asset break, you're able to show that, hey, there's a loaner asset here. You can use this for X amount of days while we fix your main asset. And throughout the workspace, you're able to see clearly who has a loaner, a loaner device, when they requested it, how long they've had it for, and when they're scheduled to return it in. Again, adding more visibility uh, as well as inventory planning and your ability to scale from automated processes here to ensure that your stock levels are up to date and you're able to leverage these functionality. Still inside the operation portion of the life cycle, complying with recalls. So we all know that you know assets will break over time uh, and that there are recalls, right? So we can take some of these examples from uh, ourselves as end user consumers, taking your vehicle, for example. A lot of the time manufacturers will call out and say, hey, there's a safety vehicle recall. Uh, please bring it into a dealership and we'll fix it. Well, that's great from the end user perspective, but what about from the organization's perspective? A lot of these recalls come with uh, governance, uh, hefty penalties if there's safety involved, uh, and we wanna ensure that our end users are safe to be able to use our products. So bringing them in to get repaired is one thing, but we need to take that a little bit further and understand, okay, how is this asset made up? What components need to be fixed, as well as where is all of these assets? So within enterprise asset management, you have that availability and capability uh, to identify all of your enterprise assets that have a recall, where they're located, who is it assigned to, and then taking it one step further, how can we fix this, right? So we know in the, for example, the location could be New York City. We can able to see the different stages of where it is in the process of repairing it, but then also to understand that, oh, this is a multi-component asset and we only need to replace a gear, not the whole engine. So we have these gears in stock and we can repair it on site. And so we're able to leverage that and use that efficiently to maximize our business functionality here and efficiency, or we can able to identify that, oh wait, this is one complete asset. We can't repair it on site. We're gonna to need to bring it in and we can plan accordingly. Moving into the maintain phase, we can start to look at our service contracts, right? So we talked about a, a lot about how the smaller portions of our assets can be built up, but how do we maintain that, right? So do they have a warranty contract? Do they need to be sent back when they get broken? We can't simply always just purchase a new one. We want to track which of our assets are still within a support or warranty contract and to leverage that so that we don't let them expire and not utilize that feature that you're paying for. And then moving into the retire portion is to take action on assets that are eligible for refresh. So refresh, it can be very subjective in terms of your organization and how an organization will want to do that. So it could be a case that there's a company policy where you have that capability of identifying for any specific model, after X amount of months, we're going to refresh that model. And that could either be due to 
uh, an internal policy or how organizations see it. Uh, additional ones could be based on contracts as well as the manufacturer's model lifespan, including the end of life or end of support that it may have for an asset. And then coming full circle around to the planning phase is planning for assets nearing the end of lease. So speaking in terms of your contracts, if an asset is going to be leased and it needs to get returned, you want to be able to be notified about this so that you ensure that you're not inquiring or occurring any sort of hefty penalties, but also being able to plan accordingly for next year's budget. So this allows you to forecast efficiently to know that, wait, I may have a refresh coming up next year, so I'm going to need to increase my budget. Or a lot of these assets that we have are coming out of lease, so we're going to have to, to purchase new ones or create a new leasing contract, um, which may increase a little bit more of our spend. Awesome. So now we are going to launch another poll referring back to those questions that Sandeep had asked you all to think about in the beginning of his slides. So we are about to launch this. So please respond to these three questions. Do you know what enterprise assets you currently own? Two, can you streamline enterprise asset processes? And how well are you maximizing usable asset life while mitigating risk? All right, Sandeep. So it looks like 40% answered less than 50% of knowing what enterprise assets they own. It looks like 48% of attendees answered somewhat when it comes to streamlining enterprise asset processes. And 62% answered need, needs improvement for question three. Okay, great. Thanks, Lauren. And so when we think about enterprise asset management, you know, what industries are useful to apply enterprise asset management to? And so I sort of spoke about, you know, this can really be applied to any sort of industry here, but there's a couple of examples that we see a lot of organizations benefiting from either, you know, falling into healthcare and life sciences, retail, transportation, manufacturing, financial services, and the list goes on and on. And to give you a little bit better uh, detailed explanation of the types of assets that we have. So we can see here that these are some of the examples that organizations leverage when it comes to the types of assets for enterprise asset management. So this is not a full list by any means or a full list of the industries that use it. It's more so to give you an example so you can start to think about your industry and your organization and where you can apply enterprise asset management uh, to ensure more success and ROI to your business. Awesome. Thanks, Sandeep, for that. Now, to end this webinar, we are going to launch one more poll, and then we will move to our Q&A session. So the last poll is, which product of ITAM are you interested in? HAM, SAM, Enterprise Asset Management, or all of the above? All right. So it looks like the majority of attendees are interested in all of the above, with 19% saying HAM, 31 saying SAM, and 2% saying Enterprise Asset Management. But it looks like everyone is interested in all products of ITAM. All right, now that brings us to our Q&A session. So I will read some questions and then Chris, Lawrence, and Sandeep, I'll let you guys kind of determine who will answer which ones. So our first question is, is there out of the box reporting that shows the value from the ROIs listed? I believe that was from Lawrence's section. That's a good question. I don't think there's any dashboards that really touch on all of the ROI uh, that you can gain from the system, but I know there is like, the hardware asset management dashboard that comes with Ham Pro that talks about asset health and things like that. Another question is, does ServiceNow agent app support RFID scanning? If not, is ServiceNow planning to do this in the near future? I can take that one. Yes, that is a feature that is coming out in Utah, I believe, that will integrate with Zebra Technologies to allow RFID scans for specific assets. Another question for you guys, is there a SAM solution possible without SAM Pro? Yeah, so there is, I, I mentioned it just very briefly, there is SAM Foundation, which is part of ITSM asset. Uh, the, the biggest challenge with that is the things that we mostly discussed for things like discovery models and normalization content library to be able to have that kind of natural normalization of publishers, of, of products, essentially all of that type of 
content is is not included with SAM Foundation. So essentially, you're doing the discovery modeling, you're creating those discovery models, you're linking those, you're creating your software models. And so essentially, you're building all of the connected tissues yourself, as opposed to having any assistance from kind of a normalized database that's assisted by, by the publishers and by ServiceNow's teams. There's also aspects of things that just don't you know, the kind of the automated reconciliation to to go through and and check compliance data. So a lot of that just doesn't doesn't work in a in a SAM foundation methodology. It really just becomes, you know, it, it's at least a centralized source for this information that you can store within the system and within within tables. But all of that kind of clear the, the biggest ROIs out of SAM are going to be missed in that regard. You're you're just going to be plugging in all of those pieces manually and, and connecting the pieces yourself. I think maybe all three of you can touch on this. How can this help the financial services? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, just speaking from Sam, uh, just the idea of being able to, the two, the two evaluations, true up costs and over license, just being able to confidently say things like we're, we're carrying this amount of dollars of extra licensing that we're not using. And we've we've not been using it for this amount of time. So to be able to properly tie that together from a licensing cost perspective, or even just being able to determine, hey, we have this amount of volume or cost associated with true ups that are legitimate true ups. So we, we can define, hey, this is what our spend is going to need to be to get our license compliant with what we use. And this is how much we're, we're overspending on this product. So how do we kind of alleviate those things is going to be a, a critical path and, and an immediate you know financial impact as well as tying together your your expenditure over time for your software licenses obviously there's other things but those are two immediate we're overspending here we need to buy more here and being able to and and it saves you from audits you know like it helps with audit protection and paying fines in that regard uh, in sam yeah, and from a ham standpoint, it's pretty similar too. Um, there's also industry regulations that you have to comply with, like ISO 27001, SOC 2 compliance, and things like that. And I'm sure in the financial services industry, there's more uh, industry regulations you have to comply with. But just knowing which hardware assets you own, where they're located, who's using them, is a great you know first step in just understanding everything to do with your assets and being able to secure your assets and being compliant for your customers and for your industry. Yep, and from an enterprise asset management perspective, you're, you're looking at any sort of assets that you have that are non-IT connected, right? So if it's a, a bank, for example, you're looking at all of your ATMs, vaults, your dispensing, the, the dispensing machine that gives out your people's money, your check reading systems, how are you maintaining your inventory from all of your different branches or different locations, any sort of office rooms that you may have that may have a television or a projector or any sort of non-connected IT devices as well will apply to, to all of your different locations. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And then I know some of you are asking pricing questions when it comes to all of these areas of asset management. So it will kind of depend on your company's needs and what you do need from ServiceNow. So if you send an email to info at glidefast.com, we can easily discuss pricing with you guys based on your company's needs. Then I think we have time for about two more questions. So here's another one. What are some of the challenges faced when implementing SAM for the first time or moving from another system? Your immediate challenges uh, to, to start out is really just comes down to gathering your entitlement data, right? So, I mean, whether you're pulling that from another system or you're getting into kind of a centralized system for the first time, the biggest hurdle to get over and that we work with uh, clients on a regular basis on is how do we gather that entitlement data? you know, for your various publishers, products, the cost per unit, how they're licensed, kind of collecting that data together so we can kind of build it into the system and start getting those insights back is one of the biggest challenges because oftentimes we find that that information is stretched across multiple components of the of the business or multiple systems uh, or even multiple owners that might have that data. So getting that information consolidated to be able to start uh, that process is that initial and first hurdle to kind of start getting going with this. 
because all of our data that we use in SAM really is is comes out of that. It, it's built off of that. So our our dashboards are populated with that. Our understanding our models is populated with that. All of our benefit it really starts there. Awesome. And then Chris, someone else asked you, does CMDB discovery work and service mapping on the foundation ITSM add benefit as a precursor to SAM Pro? I mean, it definitely does because one of the things that uh, discovery does very much like SCCM and other sources is it it helps us with the understanding of the software installations uh, because we leverage that installations data when we're looking at perpetuals and, and when we're looking at installation bases of our products, right? So that installation data that's associated with a hardware CI is still relevant and, and helpful for us because we start to use that for things like reconciliation against an entitlement and is definitely advantageous as a precursor for, I mean, for software asset management, for hardware asset management, for all of those pieces. So it's, it's definitely an advantage. And it, it's often one of the helpful components components because, you know, any opportunity that we have to have multiple sources of truth that we can reconcile and understand as that gives us a picture of your infrastructure is, is to the advantage of the delivery of these types of asset components that really have huge financial components to them. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Now, I know we're just about at the top of the hour, so we are going to pull all of these questions and make sure that they are followed up with um, so you all get your answers. But we were doing a giveaway today. So one lucky person that stayed on for the entire course of the webinar will be receiving a free asset management book written by Lawrence Tindall, who spoke on today's webinar, and a free course of GlideFast Plus. And it looks like the random winner is Brenda Gonzalez. Congratulations, Brenda. We'll be reaching out so that we can get you your prize. Today's webinar will be recorded, posted on YouTube, and you all will receive a follow-up email with today's slides, Q&A answers, and contact information so that you all can contact GlideFast with any further questions. Thank you so much to Sandeep, Chris, and Lawrence for an awesome webinar today. We look forward to hearing from you all soon. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.